I called the talk sound machine. I think machine's a good image because there's something mechanical about it, something that can be analyzed. But an image I like better is key, rhythm as a key. I think of the very precise series of indentations in the key. And it's like the sequence of sounds or a pattern of stresses or the rhythm of a poet, poem, very precisely crafted and defined. And this key slots into your heart, the seat of the emotions, or rather the body as a whole is the seat of your emotions from your toes to your scalp, which contracts when you're fearful and makes your hair stand on end. So the key, with this very specific rhythm of shape, slots into your body and turns and opens. And if that's the flash of insight, or if the grief, maybe the sudden burst of grief, or maybe the gradual cumulative grief, it's, it's all kinds of emotions that we're very, that's what we go to poetry for, for that kind of opening. And I think the rhythm is key in terms of this opening. I also like the image because a key without the door, without the lock, without the machine, is nothing, right? And that's the way the rhythm of the poetry, of the poem is without you, without your body to look through. Do any of you have somewhere in your house a pile or a bowl of keys? And you don't know where they, yes, I've got a little ceramic pot on a shelf in the kitchen. And there's about 20 keys in there, some of them in bunches, some not. And I can't throw any of them away because I should just systematically go through the house and see which are relevant and which not. But you never do that, you don't want to throw them away. But they're, when you look at them closely, they're strange things because you don't know what they belong to. And by themselves, they're so precise, right? Every indentation is just where it should be. But what's it for? And so it's meaningless in a way. And that's what a poem is without your body to go through. I mean, what is this you've got in your head? It's nothing. It's, it's ink. It's black on white, right? For the rhythm to come alive, it has to move through your body. And your body, this is what Tom talked about last night, your body is the vehicle. It's the machine. It carries the fuel that, that powers the poem. But the rhythm is maybe the key to get any, everything started. So how, how, what about this physiological aspect of it? The rhythm, uh, what, you're, you're literally, quite literally moved by the rhythm. You're made to speak patterns of sound that are very specific. And even when you read silently, you are being moved on the inside. People have attached sensors to the throat, and when you read silently, your muscles in the throat are moving. They're being stimulated. So in your gut, you're moving around. And the poet has arranged the words in such a way that uh, your gut is being manipulated in very specific ways. Right? And it's, it's, in, it's from the roots of it, where your diaphragm moves, how your breath moves, through up through your chest. It's at the tip of your lips when you pronounce a P sound. And every step of the way is very precisely being shaped. Uh, it's this exquisite manipulation that takes place of your breath and of your energy, just raw physical energy. Because if you think of what it takes to make a sound, to go from silence to sound, contractions of the muscle, and your muscles feed on what? Your, the sandwich you had an hour ago, the oxygen they're breathing. It's raw, pure energy. And that's what the poet is manipulating, <coughs> shaping, and directing as it moves through you and as you speak. That's why it's such a wonderful thing to read these, any poem aloud, isn't it? To feel them move through you. And you're being manipulated very much I think of how many of you have heard about how uh, you, you're told to smile because even if you're not happy, then licking your mouth, do the thing is going to evoke the emotion. Have you heard about that? Yeah. 
It's, I mean, it sounds a bit hokey and it sounds artificial because you want the emotion to be spontaneous. But it's, I think it's very real. And we encounter it in other ways. Normally, you know, you go from the spontaneous joy and then the smile comes. But think about meaning. Maybe one has a sudden feeling of awe and humility, which brings one to one's knees spontaneously. That sometimes happens. But what about the other way around? You're asked to kneel. People go to church, right? And that's what they do. They kneel. Their bodies assume a certain posture, which then triggers the emotion, which is meant then to evoke the feeling of awe or humility. So somehow putting your body into that shape triggers a feeling. And I think that's very much what the rhythm of a poem does. Your breath, the muscles are made to contract in a certain way um, that is the shape of anger. That's the rhythm of anger, that sputtering sound. The breath coming out like this, 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 or the holding back. And then the release. Your muscles, your body is assuming certain shapes that are associated with those feelings, triggering memories, experiences that are in your body after all. So I feel like the rhythm, the way the poem, poet establishes the rhythm of a poet, poem, what he or she's doing is, is you're almost a puppet. And I think it's a lovely thing to be manipulated that way. That's, you're very receptive to a poem because you want to be manipulated that way. And maybe your limbs aren't moving around, but quite literally in here, you're being moved around. So I think that's all I want to say about rhythm in general. Let me just think for a moment. Yes. Okay. So let's let's look at specifics here. I've been so cold. So that's why I've, I've been getting donations of clothing, but now I'm warming up. <laughs> Okay. Hopkins, famous for his sprung rhythm, and people actually argue about what that is. But uh, what one can say in general terms is there's more stressed syllables next to each other and less unstressed syllables. So instead of the more regular iambic rhythm, which might be the way we normally speak, syllables are banging up against each other and they have more stress. Now what is stress? I mean, we know accented and unaccented when we emphasize this as opposed to that. But if you pay close attention to what happens when you emphasize something, it's very interesting because lots of things are going on at the same time. Uh, for one thing, it's usually louder. This as opposed to that. I mean, just pay attention to the volume. In the word volume, vol is louder than the the other thing that happens is that the pitch is often higher. Volume, the, right? Duration, volume. It takes more energy when you take more time to say something. La, it's going to take more energy than saying la, right? It's more energy. It's that same raw material, that same raw energy that's being manipulated. When a poet arranges, stress syllables in certain ways. He's saying, now give me more energy. So you summon that energy, whether because you're saying a longer or you're saying many stress syllables in a row, you're summoning more energy in that moment. So you're, you're being moved, literally. So look at uh, this poem by Hopkins, which is, it's an interesting one to start with because it's very much about energy at that basic level, the life force which fights against despair, which fights against what pulls you into nothingness, emptiness, death. 